Chris, we might as well start at the beginning. If you could take us back, really, to uh, late 80s, early 90s. Yourself and the guys are trying to get Iona up off the ground, but it's a very, very different context to the one that would be in, in situ today. Yep. Uh, good morning, everybody. Yeah, during the 1980s, I was an academic at Trinity College Dublin in the computer science department, and we benefited from some research funds from Brussels through, at the time, what was called the ESPRI program, it's now, of course, the Framework uh, Series. Um, but in 1991, uh, we were uh, looking at the end of our funding and wondering what to do next. And when I say fa uh, we, there were five of us in a research group, a distributed systems group, in the computer science department, along with a, a bunch of research assistants and postdocs. And so somebody came up with the idea of forming a company, <laughs> and so we did in February. 1991, it was myself and uh, Sean Baker. Sean was also on the faculty, and then Henri O'Toole. Henri was a, a research assistant in the department. So the three of us founded the company. We were in Pier Street, in what's still the, the Trinity uh, Tech Transfer Office, the Innovation Office, but on the ground floor there, just directly opposite the Dart Station near the bridge uh, at Pier Street. Uh, uh, station, so that, that's where we started in February 1991. Um, you make that all sound so matter of fact, but I suppose one of the things that's worth remembering is, I mean, there was no knowledge transfer Ireland, there wasn't even an Enterprise Ireland. No, Enterprise Ireland didn't exist then. <laughs> uh, if I remember right, the Enterprise Ireland was created in 1993, so there was no EI, there was just the IDA, and at the time there was one gentleman, uh, who, who I recall well, who was responsible for all of the indigenous hardware and software industry and startups in the country, just one individual. Um, and the rest of the IDA was focused, obviously, as it still is, on attracting in multinationals. And so this particular gentleman, when we turned up and explained what we wanted to do, and for the three of us, it was the first time forming a company. We had no prior commercial experience. And he basically said, guys, gentlemen, you're not playing a croaker meaning that we weren't the big time, we were going to land 25,000 jobs in leak slip tomorrow morning. We were just three guys with no commercial experience. So we weren't playing the big time, was his view. One of the things, though, and you've written about this in your column in the Irish Times quite recently, you were able to tap into that cluster of multinationals um, I, I think I pulled out the quote from the piece. You said, in the same way that a young company could, in 1991, visit Sandyford, Ballybrit, Raheen, and other industrial estates, today a multinational can visit the Porter Shed, the Digital Hub, Nova, UCD, and other centres. It's funny how things have come full How's circle in that respect. Exactly. When, when we started out uh, and we had our, we developed our first product, uh, the first thing we did was literally get into the car and drive up to Sandyford and down to Limerick and across to Galway and talk to some of the companies individuals that we knew in places like Digital and Hewlett-Packard and ICL in Sandyford. And uh, in some cases, they were able to say, listen, this looks, sounds very interesting, but don't talk to us. Uh, I've got my friend Joe in the Chicago office. You should talk to Joe. I'll, I'll, I'll introduce you. Or Mary in San Jose. So they made those introductions for us through, into their company. Uh, and that was actually with the exception of ICL. And it turned out that actually in Sandyford at the time, we were talking to the right person in all of ICL worldwide. It was, the work was actually being done in Sandyford, so we got a hit there straight away. Straight away. And then, as I said in, in, the, in the, the piece that Connor quoted, uh, it's funny how things moved on now. So we have uh, the excellent KTI, we have a number of TTO offices, a number of accelerators in universities, and now sort of the, the, the situation has changed and the multinationals are coming, do come, want to come into the universities and find out well, what's going on, who could we collaborate with, are there some interesting startups? So the sort of the situation has flipped since 1991 when, when we started out. Because there is that, that phrase that KTI uses a lot, which is signposting. I guess at the time, you, you were nearly traveling the Bohreens, there were no signposts, you had to kind of burn it out in shoe leather yourselves. Well, it's funny, when we started going out to the States to talk to people, I mean, part of our deck, frankly, was uh, uh, a slide, a map, which said, you know, guys, you're on the West Coast, you know, all about the West Coast. We're on the West Coast, too. We're this, this little place called Ireland, not Iceland, Ireland, and we're on the West Coast. And actually, we, have, we actually had a map of Europe to show where was Ireland. 
on the west coast of Europe and drawing parallels. I mean, things have moved on an awful lot, but at the time, just getting that recognition was, was the starting point. Am I right in saying, if we could wind the clock back even further, that you had taken a trip, if I'm not mistaken, to Stanford at some point. You'd actually met Andy Berchtelsheim and, and Bill did, Joy yes. gosh, of what, what, what then wasn't even Sun Microsystems. <laughs> your, your that must age, have planted yes, a seed. My, uh, when I was a master's student, my supervisor, uh, Dr. Neville Harris, Neville's retired now, but he had done a sabbatical at Stanford University, computer science, and as a young master's student, he, he, you know, he and I flew out. It was my first trip to California. Uh, way back in the early 80s, and we visited Stanford Computer Science Department. And at that time, there was a, something, a startup called the Stanford University Network. Uh, and one of the guys, one of the founders of that was Andy Beckelshaw, he's a Belgian, who was a postgrad at Stanford. And S-U-N, Stanford University Network, became Sun Microsystems, then with Scott McNeely, a very successful multi-billion dollar company. <clears throat> and uh, Neville, uh, uh, I mean, Neville was an extraordinary gentleman, but he was really keen on startups. So uh, as Sun was being formed, he tried to negotiate, get an exclusive license uh, for distributing Sun's equipment in Europe. And so uh, he just pretty much on the spur of the, uh, of the moment said, well, you know, what are you doing about Europe? They hadn't considered Europe. So Neville said, okay, well, maybe, you know, I could be your distributor for Europe. So I learned a lot, actually, from Neville and how you seize the moment and, you know, and, and go for it. But, but that Sun involvement and Sun support would ultimately prove crucial for Iona in the early it days. It did, yes. Uh, we, we started in 1991. By the summer of 1993, we had our first product, uh, prototype product, shall I say. And to launch it, we went to a major trade show, the Object Management Group, uh, annual trade show in the Moscone Center in, in downtown San Francisco. <clears throat> and the trade show was actually held in the car park of the Moscone. But uh, we were there with our little booth that we'd air freighted out from Rath Mines and set ourselves up and uh, showed what we had, which was linking Microsoft Windows equipment to Sun's heavy, big Unix servers. And at the time, in 1993, this was quite a novel thing to do. And we... Uh, uh, didn't realize it, but the, the individuals who were at the show from Sun Microsystems were really interested in what we were doing, came and uh, saw the, the demonstration. We came back to Dublin, and then pretty much out of the blue in August, uh, Jim Green from Sun, who was a mid-tier manager, rang me and said, listen, can we come over and have a discussion? So we sat in the O'Reilly building in Trinity in the main conference room there, and Jim basically said, looked at Sean and myself and Henri and said, boys, gentlemen, have I got a deal for you? That was his famous quote, have I got a deal for you? And he sat down and talked about how they wanted to license our technology. Ultimately, that led to an investment by Sun. Uh, this was August 93, by uh, the Christmas Eve in December 1993, Sun invested in us. And uh, we then left the Trinity College campus scheme and moved out of the university. Uh, as, a, as one of the first start startups out of the Trinity. So that was, that was quite a deal and quite a break at that time. Talk to well, us about the funding climate, though. Well, the funding climate was, was really different back when we started in 1991. The, the country was in recession uh, economically, and <coughs> uh, the Guinness Peace Aviation Flotation had failed or had been pulled. There was a company called Memory Island, which was... I think one of Ireland's only startup indigenous company in the IT sector, uh, and it was publicly quoted, I think, on the ISEC, and it had had some difficulties. And it was in that climate that three relatively young people from Trinity College turn up and say, uh, we want to take on the world. And by the way, our competitors are going to be Microsoft and Hewlett Packard and Digital and IBM. And no, this is, you know, we write this is our first company, and no, we've no commercial experience. And please, would you write us a check? And so it was that, <laughs> that environment that we went out. And uh, of course, we had a business plan, but um, quite rightly, perhaps, nobody would give us any money. So we failed to, to raise any risk capital at that time. And so we funded ourselves, uh, we put each 1,000 old Irish pounds each into the company that was the initial balance sheet. And we basically traded our way through consultancy and services, trying to keep the company profitable until 
December 1993, Christmas Eve 1993, when the Sun investment uh, hit our balance sheet. In hindsight, was that something that benefited you in the, in the long term, or would you rather have had the funding from an earlier stage? Um, it, it's interesting. I think if we'd had funding earlier, we would have been in the market earlier. We were, we were slower to market than might otherwise have been the case because we had to trade profitably. We had no choice. So we had to go out and give those training courses and consultancy work to keep, <laughs> to keep the show on the road. In the meantime, in the spare time, we were trying to cr create the product. So it did take longer than we had thought. And the risk, of course, was we'd come into a, the office one morning and discover a press announcement from some company startup in Silicon Valley that had suddenly done exactly what we were doing. So we were kind of terrified that we'd missed the, miss the market opportunity. That must have been instructive, though, at least on the operational side in running the business, uh, you know, keeping, keeping the revenue coming in and, and making yeah. sure that you could actually balance the book. I'm sure that probably benefited you later on. I, it probably I, I'm thinking, did. You're, you're quite an unusual case study in that often the person who founds the company isn't the person who goes on to run the company. No, we, we absolutely had to keep the company profitable every, every month. We had a payroll every month. And <clears throat> the Sun investment, you know, we were profitable in a sense. We didn't need the Sun investment financially, but we did need it for credibility. I can talk to that in a minute. But as the company grew, we remained profitable every month. We did month by month management accounts. We were always profitable. And so we did a NASDAQ IPO in 1997. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the reasons we did that, I think, was again credibility that although we were profitable, we were an Irish company and under the Irish uh, accounting scheme and Irish pounds as our currency. And in America, our competitors who were US dollar quoted uh, were basically saying, well, you wouldn't want to deal with a little old Iona. They use the Irish quango bean or corn or something. We don't really know their accounting. They say they're profitable, but how do you know? You know, they, they don't really do American accounting rules, so heaven knows how they're cooking the books. So actually, when we did the, the, the NASDAQ IPO, we had to abide by U.S. GAAP, so called the, the American accounting rules. And that showed, in fact, because we had to do three-year historical accounts prior to the IPO, that, in fact, we were profitable. And so that was a really, again, um, major plus for us in the industry. And as Connor, you've said, it, it was unusual mm. at the time. Because that, that's quite a short time frame to go literally from zero to, to a Nasdaq IPO in six years. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, six, six years, that's right. that's right. That must have been a big challenge, though. <laughs> uh, we didn't set out planning to do a Nasdaq IPO. And in fact, we hadn't really thought about it until about 1996. <clears throat> when a gentleman from New York, Andy, Andy Malik from Lehman Brothers, <laughs> appeared on our doorstep in Dublin. Uh, so Lehman came over and met us and said, guys, have you ever thought of bringing the company public? And so we sat down and said, no, we hadn't, but talk to us about it. So we, we had a dinner and sat down and planned. To, so we started planning to bring the company public, excuse me, <clears throat> at the start of 1996. It took us about 12 months. To actually get there, we popped the IPO in February '97. And the, the, you've just reminded me, actually, the Lehman thread kind of runs through the story, doesn't Absolutely. it? There, there's a nice symmetry there. Will you tell us about yeah. ultimately? I think w the, the acquisition was one of the last that Lehman did before it went bust. Uh, well, we did, we did the IPO with Lehman in 1997. Um, Lehman at the time weren't known for high tech IPOs, they were more sort of in steel and construction and railroads and infrastructure. But they wanted to make a you know, change the, 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 or extend really what Lehman was doing. So they wanted to get into IT. And Iona was their first IT-based, ICT-based IPO. And so we went right up to the chairman and the CEO of Lehman who convinced us that they, they really did want to change what Lehman was doing. And so the, the IPO, Lehman pulled out all the stops. They were just phenomenal in the IPO and selling, uh, uh, you know, s selling the company for the IPO. And the IPO was wildly oversubscribed and very successful. But Lehman stayed with us then. We, we went public, as I say, in 97. Uh, we eventually sold the company in 2008, so 11 years. Actually, not really 11 years. It's 44 quarters as a, as a publicly quoted company on NASDAQ. And Lehman stayed with us throughout that period. And when it came to selling the company, in 2008, Lehman were our bankers because we'd always had the banking relationship with them. 
And uh, we went through the process and again selling a publicly quoted company that was dual listed on the ISIC and NASDAQ and under SEC regulations, but also under the Irish Mergers and Monopolies Commission, I forget the exact title over here. There's, you know, there's a lot of process that you have to go through. But anyway, we eventually got to the day when Lehman confirmed, listen, it's all finished. The acquiring company has paid. All of the funds have been transferred to all of your shareholders. Everything is done. The transaction is closed. And that was a Friday in September, I remember. And then we went out and celebrated that Friday evening. And then on Sunday, we woke up with a hangover and then got an even bigger hangover when we really realized Lehman Brothers was bankrupt. And so we escaped that bankruptcy literally by two days. So on Friday, we closed. On Sunday, they went bankrupt. The people we're dealing with Lehman, I, or, truthfully, I don't think they had any idea this was coming. But we could have had our shareholder funds in transit from the acquiring company to our shareholders in the Lehman bank accounts. And they were up until that last Friday, but <laughs> fortunately we escaped. And that was complete luck, completely fortuitous. We had no idea, and we were extremely lucky to escape the Lehman collapse. It's interesting when you said 11 years as a publicly quoted company, and then you quickly said 44, 44 quarters. quarters. <laughs> yes. that, that, that's telling, isn't it? Because that, that, that is a key it, thing. Absolutely. The demands on you as, as a CEO of, of a NASDAQ-listed company yep. are huge. Absolutely. It it's, it's, uh, can be very stressful. And of course, we were public at the time of September 11th. We were public when the Sarben Oxley rules came in in 2004, mm -hmm. and we had to bring in Sarben, Sarben Oxley mm -hmm. compliance, which was quite, uh, quite onerous on the company. And yeah, uh, you know, on the one hand, um, it is a tremendous load. On the other hand, it's a tremendous discipline. And I, I think until you're public, actually, generally you're not perceived as a sort of a real company. I'm thinking of customers now, and we were selling to very major corporations globally. And as a private company, you can do that. But as a private company, you're really you're a teenager. It's only when you go public and you're on NASDAQ that you're considered an adult, you know, a, a real proper vendor. And the fact that your customers and prospects can review your quarterly filings and see your financial results every quarter and how are you doing. And so that treadmill is all about credibility, really, for your customers and your partners. They can see your accounts. They can see how well you're doing. And it's independently audited. And after Saab ends Oxley, myself and my CFO had to sign, actually put our signatures to the accounts every quarter to say, to the best of our knowledge, there's no fraud whatsoever anywhere in our whole corporation worldwide. We were 1,200 people in, in 22 offices. There's no fraud anywhere, signed Chris Horn. We had to do that every quarter. And of course, had that ever been proven wrong, we would have been under not only perhaps penal uh, uh, federal um, uh, <laughs> consequences, but also civil actions from our shareholders and class action lawsuits. Unfortunately, that, that, that never happened. I've always wondered what it would take to take a government, you know, the, the Taoiseach and the Minister of Finance to sign a document every quarter to say there is no fraud whatsoever <laughs> anywhere in our, in our corporation. The head of Intel does that every quarter. The head of Boeing does that every quarter. And those corporations are bigger than, than many governments. So. So, so you managed to avoid the perp walk anyway, thankfully. Um, but talk to us about how you managed that transition, because it is an interesting one between being the, you know, one of the founders of a scrappy up-and-coming tech company, then you're into the world of, uh, of suits and ties and investment banks and, and, and quarterly reports. Was, was that difficult? Was it maybe not what you signed up for? Uh, it, it was a lesson. It was a learning every day. Um, I was very truthful with my board. I said, look, at any time, if I'm not the right person, you feel I'm not the right person, obviously, um, I'll, I'll move on. And in fact, uh, part of the story is I did uh, voluntarily step down in 2000 having been an, a CEO for, for nine years at that point. But then the company got into trouble, and I came back a second time as CEO. And to do with Steve Jobs? <sighs> I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think what got me through this was just a tremendous mentor, um, Kevin Amelia, who, who was my personal mentor. Uh, and he was very, very experienced um, finance guy. He uh, was from Wicklow. Uh, actually, originally from Mayo, um, and a G strong GA fan, but he became corporate controller of digital in Maynard, Massachusetts. He then became chief financial officer of Sun Microsystems, and then moved on to form his own uh, global outsourcing company, 
uh, for which he raised money from DFJ in New York and then took the company public on NASDAQ. But Kevin was my mentor and he was uh, the non-exec chairman of our board and just a phenomenal fellow. Unfortunately, Kevin's now deceased, but he was a tremendous uh, mentor and partner for me. So all those times when I wasn't quite sure what to do or Kevin would say, well, you know, he's seen the movie before. That was one of his phrases. You know, you talk to people who've seen the movie before and they can tell you what to do. <laughs> and that now, obviously, is a role that you fulfill yourself. <clears throat> I, I, I hope so. I'm very fortunate in working now with uh, Atlantic Bridge, which is an investment firm here in Ireland. And specifically, we have what's called our University Bridge Fund that was seeded by Trinity and UCD. It's about uh, 15 months now that we've been investing. We've done about eight or nine deals. <clears throat> but I know my colleagues at Atlantic Bridge and the University Bridge Fund are specifically looking for startups. In some sense, I mean, don't quote me, looking for the, you know, the next IOTA, the next company coming out of university that we can help grow. And so if I can give back something to the, the Irish system through helping mentor and work with the young companies, that would be a tremendous result. Kevin did that for me, and so I hope that I can provide some of that same degree of feedback Kevin gave me to some up-and-coming young companies today. What do you look for in a company, and what, what would excite you about a spin-out? Gosh, first of all, I think it's, it's the commitment and the enthusiasm of the team. You know, it, it's you're giving some of the best years of your career, the best years of your life to this, so are you really in for it? And it can be a long haul. I mean, in my own case, it was 17 years of, of my life. So you look the people in the eye and say, are you really up for this? Do you realize what you're, what you're doing? Do you realize how deep this puddle is before you step into it? Because it, it can be a pretty deep puddle. And so talking through just expectations and what it means for them and are they really up for it? So the, the character, the personality of the founding team is really important. Now they may not be a complete team, they may, may need to bring in extra talent but their enthusiasm and commitment is going to be what drives their ability to, to attract people to come and join them as part of the overall journey. So their commitment and belief has to be really, really strong. And as well as that, of course, they need great ideas, they need great technology, but fundamentally it's the, the character of the people. Do they have that commitment? What areas are you enthused about at the moment? Then? Well, I guess my own background is electronics and then enterprise software, so I'm obviously very interested in the software area in general. Um, and we have some exciting things happening there in some of the portfolio companies that we have. Um, but also the, the interesting thing about the university fund is it's not just software which was, and hardware, which was the traditional Atlantic Bridge uh, uh, domains, but it's also medical technology agri-tech, green energy, material sciences. So I'm learning a lot about areas that I had no previous experience in and learning <laughs> about what the dynamics of, of new industries through some of the companies that we're working with and talking to. So it, it continues to be a learning experience for me. You spoke to us about the context in, in 1991. If you're, if you're starting a campus company or a spin-out today, uh, What's available to you now that wasn't then? How much oh, easier is it? Well, well so Enterprise Ireland, <laughs> uh, tr a tremendous organization, uh, KTI, obviously. But, but general, more generally, there's much more risk capital available today. And there are investors looking for startups. They want to invest. They have money to spend. There are multinationals sniffing around looking for opportunities to collaborate. So that the environment here is very, very different. And um, Dublin and Ireland is now certainly on the global map, you know. Most uh, people, particularly in, in the software industry, recognize Ireland. And I can remember meeting a guy from uh, Motorola in Arizona, and he said, listen, here in Motorola, there are three eyes that we actually fear and we think are competitive, and that's Israel, India, and Ireland. And that was the view in America, this tremendous endorsement about how far the country has come. So um, the, the situation is completely different. I think there's a lot more interest in entrepreneurship. There's a lot more public acceptance of it, frankly, uh, by the general public and by policy in, makers in what and way? politicians. In what way do you think people are more accepting of the climate? Because well? I think going back to uh, when we started in the 90s, failure was, was generally, culturally, much more of, a, of an issue. And even entrepreneurship is slightly a dicey word, I think, for some people. 
But I think today that that situation has changed and failure is understandable and acceptable. And as, as long as you professionally fail and you're willing to go again, uh, that's good. And so I think culturally we've, we've moved on an awful lot. You mentioned the greater availability of risk capital. Are, are we where we'd like to be as a country in no, terms of... No, obviously we're not. Uh, it is a tremendous improvement, uh, but there's still scope for, for, for a lot more. And I think particularly that gap between kind of seed stage and expansion stage, you know, the Series A, Series B, is, you know, in the last decade or so, that has been an issue. It, it is being addressed now. But clearly we could do more. And... Um, when all, only contrast us with, say, Tel Aviv and Israel, where I can't remember the latest figures, but in about 2013, 2014, there was more venture capital going into Israel than the rest of Europe combined. So you added up United Kingdom, Germany, Italy, Ireland, France, Spain, added all of that up, and Israel was even more than the cumulative European, the rest of Europe venture capital. That may not be quite the situation, I'm not up to date on my figures, but still, there's tremendous amount still going in there. And I think Arnhem could do still, there's, there's more opportunities, frankly, here in this country than there is funding available. I know it's a hoary old debate, but I'm going to plunge into it. If you look at the greatest hits of, of spin outs, the likes of Iona, Norcom, Havoc, or even yep. more recently, the likes of Log Entries and Feed Henry, we see this trend whereby, and I know it's far from a national tragedy if your company is sold for 60 or 70 million, but yes. there is a level, there does seem to be a ceiling beyond which companies don't tend to get here, that they get taken out. Yep. Um, what do we need to do, or do we need to do anything differently to get to the point where you could it, get a Google or a Sun from our... It's Ireland? not a national issue so much as uh, an industry issue. It, it, it's not peculiar to Ireland. It happens in, other, in many other countries too. And even if you look at Israel, there are comparatively few companies that have got through that sort of 60 million, 100 million uh, uh, valuation even or, or revenue. The, the issue really is the way that risk capital tends to work and the timing of funds. So. If a, if a risk capital of venture company, seed stage company comes into a firm, they have giving returns or promising returns to their investors to a particular cycle, typically a five-year cycle, 10-year cycle. And so as uh, the investors come to the end of their cycle, they're looking to get returns, and realize returns for their investors. And that can sometimes force perhaps uh, arguably uh, premature exits for companies. So the, the secret actually as an entrepreneur is to line up a series of you know, best doors, making sure that they can go for the long time, the ability perhaps to replace one investor with a new investor to uh, mm. replace him in the cycle. Uh, I should have said, by the way, Iona didn't have any venture capital because nobody would give us any. <laughs> <laughs> the only investor we had was Sun Microsystems. But uh, nevertheless, there's this issue about how to manage your investors and the family investors as you grow your company is is obviously something that a, a CEO has to wrestle with and be familiar with just what's possible and what the rules of the game are. And it is an international game, it's not a domestic game here. That quote you cited with approval where Ireland, India and Israel were seen as the big threats, um, you do a lot of travelling obviously, and hmm. when you go further afield in Ireland you realise every country bids itself or pitches itself as a knowledge centre, you yes. know, that they have an innovation culture. How does Ireland stack up though really on that score? Well, yes, I mean, if you go to Singapore, in particular Singapore, or you go to Shenzhen, or you go to uh, Bengaluru, Bangalore, go to Melbourne, Australia, it, it is the same story where, wherever you go. And so if you're a multinational, it's quite a confusing uh, landscape to look out at and say, well, where is the action? The action is happening everywhere. The differentiation that, that Ireland has, that not even Silicon Valley has, is the multinationals. We have a density of multinationals in this country that not even Silicon Valley has. And it's not like Silicon Valley is primarily software and ICT. The beauty about Ireland is it's not just software and ICT, it's pretty much everything. It's FinTech, it's MedTech, it's, it's AgriTech. And that's a tremendous strength that no other location on the planet has. It's a tremendous asset that we have. And so we should never forget that. Um, and as we look about uh, announcements or discussions uh, across Europe on corporation tax and what's going to be the future of European taxation policy. The opportunity in Ireland is to embed our multinationals even further by having greater collaboration between the indigenous sector and the multinationals so that we're doing more and more R&D here that we're seen as a dynamic hotbed of innovation and, and creativity. And that's what's going to keep the multinationals here. It's no longer going to be tax. It's going to be our ability to innovate, uh, do 
world-class research, and we are, by the way, and embed the multinationals even further into the economy than we are already. And the KTI figures tend to stack that up, that we're seeing Absolutely. collaboration at a much yes. greater level. I mean, you spoke about you know, essentially having to bring the mountain to Mohammed in 1991. Nowadays, that, that, that seems to be happening much more organically, and thanks to the likes of Knowledge Transfer Ireland, companies know where to go when they're looking for partners and when they're looking to license technology, and yeah. they, they, they can get there fairly easily with the help of agencies such as KTI if they want that. Yeah, there's, I hesitate even to say the words, but there's this infamous, perhaps, or famous, uh, innovation Task Force set up by Brian Cowan's administration back in, what was it, 2008, 2009, 2010. I was a member of that task force. But one of the things that came out of the Innovation Task Force is the lack of sort of a, a portal of what the heck is happening in Ireland as a, you know, if I'm a multinational or a researcher looking for a collaboration part. And at the same time, there were different and varying uh, licensing policies across the, the various universities and institutes of technology. So there's a need for something like KTI, and then we were delighted then, then KTI was formed, if I remember rightly, was it 2013, 2014, uh, 2013? Alison, thank you. Um, so KTI has filled a gap that we have, and again, I think if you look internationally, this KTI is kind of relatively unique on the global landscape, and uh, Talking to American colleagues, they're just astounded that we have KTI. I mean, trying to get that same perspective and even what's happening in Texas or what's happening in California, it's just not there. You have to go around and shop around. So KTI is part of Brand Ireland and providing tremendous service for those looking for collaboration and for research. Uh, partners. We're fast running out of time, unfortunately, Chris. I know we could probably talk for a lot longer. We're just interested in getting your view uh, before we wrap up on, on Brexit. What, what impact do you think it's going to have specifically on, uh, on the third level institutions and, and, and on the innovation culture that we have? I, I, I hate to say it because you know, I, th I think we're all are sad about Brexit, truthfully sad, but, but it is a fantastic opportunity for Arnold unfortunately, for, for, for our colleagues in, in the United Kingdom, because I think it, it is already leading to a stronger interest by British nationals and those other nationals in Britain to look to Ireland as an alternative venue for what they're doing. I think it's going to bring more researchers here, more research collaborations. Um, so I think it's, it's very, very unfortunate. I think it's very, very sad. I think it's the wrong thing for the, for the United Kingdom, but I do think it's a huge opportunity, and, and that's proving to be the case. Uh, for, for the so Irish I think it could be a pull factor for talent. Absolutely, and for investment, not just for talent, but both. For investment, really? Yeah. Because yeah. I suppose one of the consequences that we're, we're dealing with at the moment and the business is dealing with is obviously the, the, the currency devaluation, which I imagine has consequences in, with, with your Atlantic Bridge hat on. It does. Uh, we have some of our portfolio companies are operating or selling into the UK, so it's certainly they're affected by the, uh, the exchange rate. But of course, you can use natural hedging. You know, if you've got uh, facilities, if you've got staff on the ground in the UK, you try to organize things so that effectively you're breaking even the UK. The revenues in the UK are covering your costs in the UK and manage that. So that would be a classic technique that, that, that's used to manage the risk. Before we go, for, for those in the room who are looking to kind of replicate the journey you've taken, um, biggest mistake and, and what you would have done differently if you, if you could do it all over again? Oh gosh, again? My, one of my mistakes with enormous respect is, remember I was a first time CEO. I was learning on the job every day. And I thought, gosh, this is just a fantastic opportunity, a fantastic ride, <laughs> I'm having so much fun, that as a result, I tended, frankly, to over-promote my, my own people, so that when I was looking for a new head of this or a head of that, rather than bringing in external talent, I'd said, well, listen, I've, I'm not being replaced as CEO. <laughs> the people are staying with me as the board of directors, therefore, this person that I already employ can be promoted to this new position. So I tended to over-promote, certainly in the early days, I think internally, whereas perhaps I should have been more balanced mm -hmm. and bringing in new talent, fresh talent, or, alongside my, my in-house team. And that was a mistake that I think I made, because sometimes people got out of their depth a little bit. Um, but anyway, we recovered from situations. That was one mistake. And, and, and the key piece of advice for anyone starting out? Gosh. Uh, you. In my strong view, you've got to have a business partner, and in my case, I was lucky to have two. It was Henri and Sean. Uh, I don't think you can do this on your own. It, even though you're CEO, at the end of the day, you are you know, on your own, but having t one or two key business partners, co-founders, that you can go and shoot the breeze with and, 
Uh, they'll lift you up when you're depressed. You lift them up when they're depressed and keep them in an even keel. And most importantly, that those business partner or partner or partners should not be your social partner. I think it's just wrong to bring the worries of the business home at the end of the day. So don't confuse your social partner, your life partner with your business partner. In my view, they should be different people. So I heard a nice line uh, earlier on, I was talking to, to Sean Factor, an entrepreneur who's in Nova UCD, who said, uh, you need two people to start with. You need the hacker and the hustler, the person who grinds <laughs> away behind the scenes and the person who uh, goes and that, sells the business. That, that's true too. Uh, uh, Gosh, I'm thinking, I think once you're a public company, there's another pairing that comes into play, and that's the CEO and the CFO. And the CEO is the brash kid, the hustler, selling on Wall Street, and the CFO is the mature adult who says, listen, guys, let me tell you how it really is. <laughs> and so you've got a bit of theater almost, the actors between the CEO and the CFO. So there's that uh, relationship as well. So be the finance guy and the leader, as well as the technical guy and the leader. That obviously casts you as the hustler, though, Chris. <laughs> I've been known to hustle in my time. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, on that note, Dr. Chris Horn, I think we'll leave it. Thanks very much for chatting Thank to you us this morning. Thank you.